Hi, my name is Emma Vogel and I'm from the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas. I'm here today in front of the Libertyville 7 Mercury capsule. This capsule unfortunately sank into the ocean during the Mercury Redstone missions when the capsule hatch door accidentally detonated, allowing water to pour in. In 1999, the Cosmosphere was instrumental in the recovery and restoration of this capsule so it could be displayed to the public. Here to tell you more about underwater salvage diving is Navy diver and astronaut Heidi Marie Steffenshin Piper. Hi Heidi, so glad you could join us today. Hello Emma, it's nice to be with you. Could you tell us about the average day for a naval diver? Is there a lot of training or is there ever really an average day? I think probably the latter. Um, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine what an average day is for a Navy diver because so much of it is going to depend on what you're doing that day. If you have a, if, if you have a job, um, a, a task being a, whether it's a diving, strictly diving, salvage, um, underwater ship husbandry, some sort of location dive, um, we get called for a lot of things. Uh, probably one of the things that is uh, very typical uh, for a Navy diver, and again, unless you're on, on dive ops, um, physical activity is a big part of it. Um, most, Navy, most Navy divers will start their day with some sort of, um, we call it PT, uh, some sort of physical training. Uh, because staying fit is very important for diving. Um, not only is it a strenuous job to be underwater and there's a lot of heavy lifting, um, but if you're fit, they have found that uh, uh, in diving, uh, that dissolved nitrogen tends to accumulate in fat tissues. And so if you stay fit, you are less likely to get the bends. So, uh, so physical training is important um, as a diver. And then, like I said, after that, the, the, uh, the, your day is gonna depend upon what you're doing. Um, if you have a, a dive operation, say one of the things I did a lot of was uh, underwater ship husbandry, which basically is fixing ships with divers instead of putting the ship into dry dock. And so if we have a job, we'll, we'll get on the work site, we'll have to tag out the ship so that there's no suctions or anything um, working in the area of where the divers are. And, uh, and then we start working in, uh, generally we'll put uh, divers in shifts because um, like I said, it is hard work. Um, typically if you're in colder water um, than the air temperature. So, so if you're working in cold water um, that does take a toll on your body and we don't want you know, divers to get hypothermia underwater. Uh, but also the other reason why we have to work in ships is because of um, if it's a deeper dive, uh, probably not on a ship because most ships are only about 45 feet of water, but you have to wor worry about, um, like I said, the bends. Um, if you're in uh, doing a salvage stop deep down, the depth of your water is gonna uh, dictate how long you stay underwater. And if you're not actually in the water, there's a lot of positions uh, topside for a diver. Um, whether you're, you know, the diver tender, you're the comm operator, you're working the logs, you're, you're doing tools, um, just a lot of work, different jobs to be done. So never a boring day for a Navy diver. Could you tell us about some of your favorite salvage operations or favorite parts of training? Okay, so, uh, Fun parts of training, a lot of it is uh, when you're successful. Um, if you have a training operation that involves a salvage, um, then obviously the greatest part of that is when you're successful and you, you know, if you're doing your training on a barge and it's in water and so generally it will, you know, it's sunk. So you have to, re you have to restore buoyancy to that object and so, You'll be patching up holes um, and attaching lift bags to provide additional buoyancy. And so um, the best feeling usually is, is that when that, uh, when that object comes to the surface, um, you know, there's that feeling of accomplishment. What are some of the dangers of diving alongside a salvage operation? So dangers during salvage operation, um, there's, you know, obviously lots of them. First of all, you're in the water. Um, and most salvage operations are going to be, you know, 
they're going to be deep, but they won't be, you know, extremely deep because um, as, you know, humans, we are limited to how far we can go underwater. And so um, per the Navy, uh, we will only dive on air to 190 feet. And then anything deeper than that, up to 300 feet, we will use a mixed gas mixture. And so if there's, you know, and so for example, one of the salvage jobs that I was not on, but um, a number of years back, the Navy did the salvage of uh, parts of the Merrimack. And that was in about 200, 220 feet of water. And so all of that diving had to be done with mixed gas. So when you're working underwater like that, um, you know, the first dangerous part of that is gonna be the fact that your helmet and all of the systems that support that helmet, you know, your hoses, the topside equipment, everything, that's your life support. And if something goes wrong, you can't just take your helmet off. Um, if you're doing a really deep dive and you have decompression stops on the way up, um, you have to do those. Um, although one option that the Navy does have is that we will have a recompression chamber um, on site when we're doing deep dives so that if we have some problem in the water, you can do your decompression in the chamber. So you do a surface decompression. And so what we'll do is we'll bring the divers up and then we have a very short period of time that we have to get the divers off the stand and into the chamber and press back down to, to depth so that they don't, again, we don't, we don't want them to get any kind of decompression sickness, the bends. Um, so that's one of your, one of your big um, hazards of diving is the fact that you're in the, you know, you're, you're dependent on life support system. Um, you know, another issue is because you're down there working on something that has failed, whether it's some sort of wreck. So you've always have that um, problem of a mechanical type failure uh, because of, you know, whether it's structural activity, um, integrity, or a piece of equipment falls on you or something like that. So you always have to be aware of your surroundings um, when you're working on a salvage uh, job because you don't want to create another problem um, that's gonna put you in danger and again, impact your life support systems. Um, a lot of times, you know, salvage has flammable on board. And even though you're underwater, there can be air pockets. And if you get, you know, that you don't wanna create any kind of, any kind of spark down there that's gonna ignite those and, and, uh, and, and create a, you know, an underwater, you know, it's an explosion and it doesn't have to be a bad explosion to impact a, a person underwater. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, people always think of the biggest hazard being marine life. You know, people like to talk about sharks in the water. Um, that's really not that big of an issue because most sharks really don't like people. So they tend to stay away from us. Here at the Cosmosphere, we have Gus Grissom's Liberty Bell 7 capsule which is found in the Atlantic Ocean at 16,000 feet below the sea. What are some of the difficulties of retrieving something at that depth? Well, so at 16,000 feet, we're not putting people that deep. Um, as, a, as a human being, we can't withstand that pressure, um, even if you know, we are in a dive suit. Um, so you're doing that with a remotely operated vehicle. And so the issues you have there, and it was shown the first time they tried to retrieve it, they lost an ROV because the cable severed. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, the, that's one of the problems you're gonna have is when you have 16,000 feet plus of cable out to your ROV that, uh, you know, if something happens to that cable, now your, your vehicle is lost. So you're having to do everything on a salvage that deep remotely and, and so uh, that's one of the hardest things of doing deep, deep salvage is the fact that you can't get down there working hands-on and you have to do everything with a remotely operated vehicle. The hatch of the Liberty Bell 7 was not found during the 1999 operations. Could you describe how a future diver might find the hatch if it was found today? Well, you would probably locate it the same way they found uh, the Liberty Bell and that's with a side scan sonar. Um, but again, the hardest thing there is, if you think about the size of the hatch, uh, 
looking for something that really that small um, is is like you know the proverbial needle in a haystack. Uh, I've been on on salvage jobs where we've you know been on a ship and you're just going back and forth, back and forth um, across the ocean with the side scan sonar in the water, looking for you know a piece of debris or you know, quite often when an airplane goes down, you want to find that black box. And so you're looking for that in the water. And of course, the deeper the salvage is, then the harder it is, because as that object sinks to the bottom, there's a much, much larger area that it could fall into, um, just because it's traveling through 16,000 feet of water, as opposed to, you know, say 160 feet of water. And so that's the hard part is trying to find something that small in the ocean um, is very, very difficult. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, in the future we get better, um, better equipment, better um, electronics that can detect an object and detect it as, you know, the hatch as opposed to anything else that's on the, the ocean floor. You joined the astronaut office in 1996 when NASA just started gearing up for the construction of the ISS. Do you think being a Navy diver helped you stand out in the application process? Well, I definitely think that being a, a diver and having that, that diving background, that familiarity in the water, and not just being familiar and being comfortable in the water, but also having worked underwater. Because it's one thing to you know, go scuba diving and go underwater, look at reefs, look at, you know, look at fish underwater and being underwater and actually having to do work and understanding the concepts of what you can and cannot do underwater and how it is that you have to get yourself into position to be able to do work. Um, because it's not like standing on the ground. Um, you know, the simplest thing of, you know, when we're, working and you know we have our our pgt which is the power grip tool which is the uh, the the drill um if you want to call it that that we use on orbit for loosening fasteners and tightening fasteners and things like that uh, think about it when you're you know working in your garage and you're using a drill um it's usually pretty easy to just you know you can just hold it and and push the button and you're standing and you're providing that reaction force so you don't move with it. Uh, but when you're in space and same thing when you're underwater is that if you don't secure your body in some way or have some means to counteract that force, um, if you just hold that drill and squeeze the trigger, you're gonna go around with it and it's not gonna be effective and, and it's, that's not what you wanna have happen. Um, and so, Having that diving background where um, I did work underwater, um, I think that definitely helped me get selected as an astronaut. You mentioned training earlier. When you became an astronaut, one of your jobs was spacewalking. Why do spacewalkers train in such a giant pool? Well, because in the giant pool, when we go underwater you know, for our training, uh, we're called neutrally buoyant. So, which means that we don't float and don't sink. Um, so we're wearing our spacesuit, and it's the same spacesuit as we use in space. It's just our training varieties um, are the ones that we use on the water. It's, it's so it's the same suit, not physically the same suit, but but the similar type design. Um, but the biggest difference of being in the water is that we have an umbilical. Uh, which is a, an air hose line. And then with the, com, the communication cable is married up with it. And that's what provides our breathing medium because in the pool, you're under a higher pressure and there's no way we could carry that much gas in our backpack. Um, so in the pool, uh, that's about the only difference. Um, we're weighed out neutrally buoyant. So as our spacesuit inflates, um, even though the spacesuit is is you know, very, very heavy on the ground. Um, once we get in the water and the suit is inflated, then we're actually, you know, we'd be uh, floating in there. 
So divers actually have to put weights um, and they put weights um, under the PGT on the chest because uh, the electronics module doesn't work in the pool in the pool unit. And so that's just, that's a weight. Um, They'll put weights on our arms and our legs, and it's just there to help us stay neutrally buoyant. And the divers are very good, the support divers at the NBL, they're very, very good at being able to tweak us just so that we float just perfectly. You know, we want to float in a way that we're just, just slightly at an angle, um, just because it's more comfortable to work. And they can get us at that angle, um, depending upon what our tasks are for the spacewalk that we're training for underwater they may have to tweak us a little bit at different times but uh but otherwise if you get a good way out um you know i've had the same way up for six and a half hours or six hours underwater um, and so being neutrally buoyant and floating in that work column is about as close as you're going to get to an approximation of being in space on the ground because the only way to get weightlessness for any length of time on the ground is when we go out in NASA's zero G airplane. And when the airplane flies parabolas, um, meaning the airplane gets out to altitude and then it takes a, a deep dive down. And for about 20 seconds, you get the feeling of weightlessness. And you do, you do float inside the, uh, the fuselage of the airplane, but you can't do that for training for a six and a half hour EVA, because you just can't train a six hour task in 20 second increments. And so the, we do all of our uh, spacewalk training underwater. In 2007, you were the commander of a 12 day exhibition at the bottom of the ocean in an underwater lab called NEMO. Could you tell us about the work you did there and the experiments you did and how it relates to working in space? Sure. So NEMA was NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations um, Experiments, if you want to call it that, that it was a series of missions. I was on the 12th one that took place in the Aquarius Habitat, which is a habitat off of Key Largo, Florida. It sits in 45 feet of water. It's administered by, by NOAA and various different groups uh, can utilize this environment for different studies. Um, a lot of the studies are done by, you know, marine biologists, marine ecologists, uh, because what it allows uh, various groups, whether it's scientists, engineers, NASA astronauts, to live in the habitat um, and being underwater in that environment means you can go out for multiple diving expeditions and not have to come up to the surface for decompression reasons. Um, we're in a saturated environment, um, and so we're able to stay down for a given period in the habitat. So what NASA was using it for is to look at, um, initially was uh, different analogies with space station, utilizing it for training for space station, and then it eventually progressed into uh, utilizing it to explore different um, concepts for going to the moon. So our mission, um, you know, so we were like a lunar mission where we would go out and do various activities outside on the ocean floor, which is analogous to being on the surface of the moon and going outside for doing various expeditions that they would on the surface of the moon. And so by being underwater, uh, you know, one of the um, experiments, if you want to call it, that we did is we had support divers come out for the day and they had us doing different tasks um, that they would be doing on the moon, like, you know, collecting rocks, digging holes, um, doing samples like that. And they would weigh us out to, to different scenarios to see what was most efficient and that information would be used to design the suits uh, for lunar missions um, because um, unlike spacewalks where you're in a zero G environment, you know, the moon has gravity. And so you have gravity that you have to, you know, just live with. 
Um, but that's going to affect your suit design because, you know, where do you want the CG in the suit? Um, you know, you don't want it. You want it in a place where it's going to be comfortable to work, but yet you have different types of tasks, whether they're bending over, picking things up or bending over, um, doing, you know, work like shoveling or even just walking, you may need the different types of suits. And so they're trying, they're looking at different, um, and you know different types of loading on the suit to see what would work best for um, a lunar environment, and also for a Mars environment, and to see can you use the same suit for both um, when we eventually go to Mars. So that was uh, one of the experiments that we were doing on Nemo, um, and at the same time, it's also the you know looking at how would you structure a day on the moon or your time on the moon because we were in the habitat for two weeks. And you know, how do you structure your day where you have different tasks to do, but yet you're not going to be um, in constant communications with mission control like we're used to on the shuttle and the space station. You've had quite an amazing career from being in the Navy to being an astronaut, then back to the Navy. What can you say to students out there who have dreams of being a diver, an engineer, or an astronaut? So if that's your dream, uh, I would tell you to go ahead and follow your dream. Um, to me, it seemed like a very logical progression to go from being a Navy diver to being an astronaut. Because when you look at an astronaut out on a spacewalk, to me, that looked a lot more like diving than it did flying. And so to me, that was a logical pro progression. Um, if that's your dream, I would say you have to take it one step at a time. And make sure that you know what you're going into before you get into that dream. Um, I know a lot of people that decide that, you know what, I want to be a Navy diver. And so figure out what does it take to be a Navy diver? Um, first thing is that it's not easy because as we say, if it was easy, everybody would be a Navy diver. And so figure out what you have to do physically. Um, physical activity is a big part of it. Um, when I first looked at becoming a Navy diver, um, I tried to do a pull-up, and I think I maybe got one. Well, after working at it, I could do pull-ups. Um, I could run. And so I met all the physical requirements. I did it. I made it through, and I had a great time. Um, same thing for becoming an astronaut. Um, what does NASA look at? NASA looks at what's your education? You know, I have, I'm an engineer. Um, I got my degrees in mechanical engineering. So make sure you have that education background that NASA wants. Um, work experience, like I said, Navy diving, fixing ships, working on salvage underwater. Um, that works very well into doing spacewalks. And then just keep at it um, because very few people um, actually get selected. I feel extremely, extremely lucky that I had the opportunity to fly not just once, but twice in space and get to do spacewalks. But you know what? I loved my career as a Navy diver. And even if I hadn't become an astronaut, I think I would have had a very successful career staying in the Navy. And so you have to make sure that that's something you want to do. Um, you know, don't become a Navy diver because you see, oh, look, you know, Heidi was a Navy diver. She became an astronaut. So I'm going to become a Navy diver. And if you don't like water, then you definitely don't want to be a Navy diver. And so uh, pick a career that's something that interests you, you like, you want to do. And make sure you're good at it because NASA is only going to pick the best. And if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to be good and you're not going to be the best. So NASA won't pick it. But if you pick something that you're good at and you like doing it, even if you never become an astronaut, you've just done a successful career of something you like doing. So that's what you really wanna look at is what do you like doing and what are you good at? Thank you so much, Heidi, for joining us and sharing your experiences. Okay, it's been a pleasure, thank you.